We are very glad today to welcome Dr. Buck Woodard from American University to be the first of our presenters as we begin to commemorate 375 years of this parish. In 2025, we marked that occasion, but we felt like we should take a little bit of time and just sort of pace ourselves through this and allow ourselves to tell a little bit of a different story than we have in the past. And so this Sunday and the next three weeks, you'll hear presenters, as you see on your brochure, that are coming to sort of tell us the context, the world of 1650 to 1750, that very long first century of our existence, so that we may sort of understand as we get to 375, what are the themes that are taking place today. Dr. Wood is gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. I'll bring the microphone to you so everybody can hear you. This presentation is being recorded and we plan to release it after some editing, probably in February when we celebrate our birthday annually uh, on that occasion. Uh, afterwards, there we are graciously invited to a reception in the parish house that is being hosted by the DAR chapter, the Augustine Warner chapter, and you can have more conversation and follow up. Dr. Woodard will be there as well. So don't feel like once you leave here, the presentation is over with. It continues on as we continue to learn and, and grow in this area of our history. So without me chatting any further, welcome Dr. Woodard. I'm glad you're with us. Thank you very much. I will try to speak up. This microphone doesn't exactly uh, pick up all the, every time I turn my head, it kind of goes in and out a little bit, whether I'm down or up. But I'll use my uh, classroom voice from the professor, if that's okay, and, and try to project as, as, best, as best I can. And when we come around later, we'll do a Q&A, and you can raise your hand just like, uh, just like in school. Thanks to uh, Sven Van Bars and um, the, the wider Abingdon family for the invitation and an opportunity to come and, and, and speak today. Uh, I'm delighted to be talking about indigenous cosmology and worldview, the native peoples of this region, Algonquian speakers, and then thinking about their relationship to the Church of England during uh, the time period for the church's anniversary. That's mid-17th mid century into the 18th century. And if we have time, uh, some outcomes and where we are today in the story. So maybe we can, you know, see the continuity of, of past and present. So let's, let's jump in, if we can. All right, so I think it's a good idea if we're talking about indigenous cosmologies to start with native peoples and just take one episode of cosmic time to just tell you a story about their beliefs, a, a portion of their beliefs about the beginning of the universe and how it, how it came to be. We received this information from multiple locations, and while I'll use some of the historical data that we know about from the earliest uh, English visitors and wrote, who wrote things down, I'm also borrowing some from later stories and narratives that are companion pieces and, and that match. And so it's really a, a, an Algonquian view that would be found up and down the, e the east, eastern seaboard from, say, the Carolinas up into Maine. There are multiple different uh, spirits, I'll call them. I'm not going to say gods, but maybe uh, other than human beings that are out there in the, in the, the universe prior to the creation of uh, humans. Um, a couple of those individuals can be known by celestial bodies that we know, so that the, the sun has a relationship to um, the most supreme uh, being and has a male category, and that the moon is related to um, sometimes it's, it's called a grandmother or the old woman that never dies, and that's related to the moon. So that's a feminine category. The sun and the moon have these dual responsibilities. Uh, there's multiple stories about their escapades and how it came to be that there were two hero twins that were born um, from this, these two celestial bodies, a daughter of maybe one of the celestial bodies. It di differs depending on which story we listen to, but there are two hero twins, not unlike Cain and Abel, actually. One has a real positive and balanced uh, kind of positionality. The other one's a little more chaotic. I want to say negative, but chaos is a good word to, to use. Um, and so the, the positive creator, this individual, he's responsible for multiple things that we know in our universe today that are good, uh, plants and waters. Um, whereas the, the more chaotic brother is responsible for the creation of things like rapids that are in the water. Um, or thorns and briars that would be, uh, you know, would hurt us when we were out there. Poisonous things such as would come from snakes and so forth. So these two, these are two important 
hero twins and, and, and figures. And along the way, um, there is also a series of beings other than human beings that we could connect to the four corners of the universe. So north, out, north south, east, and west. And we might think of them as four giants or four pillars that hold up the universe on the corners of those cardinal directions. And they uh, can be acquainted with winds as well, that winds blow from those locations in our universe. So we're setting up sort of a cosmic landscape. There is an above world, that's the domain of the sun and the sky, and there are uh, colors associated with this above world. We can think of it, uh, you know, things that are light and bright are good. The sun is in that category too. There's also a duality over and over again in native cosmology. So having two twins, having the sun and the moon, having a light and dark, each of these are dualisms that will repeat themselves over and over and over in native beliefs. So while some things can be feminine, they can also be masculine depending on context. While some things are bright when it's daytime, we know this, the moon is also bright when it's dark outside. So there's, there are dualisms that exist within this belief system. The above world, the sky world we might think of it, is partnered by the below world or the underworld. And the underworld is where the domain of darkness and the moon live. And at different times, and you know this because you live in this very same world, they will change places. And there will be a change of night, of night and day, back and forth. And this will happen in a cycle over and over again. Through the middle of this, of this sky world and the below world is, a, is an axis. In anthropology, we call it an axis mundi. Uh, but in native cosmologies, it takes, the, it takes the form of sometimes a great tree of peace, Sometimes it's a white tree of peace, it's a white pine tree, sometimes it's a, um, a cottonwood tree, it depends on the community, but it tends to be a pillar that goes through the middle of the sky world, through this world, which is our domain, and then into the below world. So I just set up this, this, uh, this cosmogram, if you will, about how the world is organized, and I encourage you to think about I've already mentioned Cain and Abel. I want you to also think about heaven and hell because they, are, they can be extended to these ideas once uh, native peoples of the region become introduced to Christianity. I'm not saying it replaces it, but it can be extended. One of the creations uh, of the positive character was a great white-tailed deer, a white-tailed deer. And if you're from this region, even if you're not from this region, you probably know there's white-tailed deers in the east and in the south. Put this great white-tailed deer uh, I'll point to that there, that's a figure there, kind of a cosmic deer. And the persona of this good twin we'll call the, the giant rabbit or the great hare. This is the dualism of Algonquian belief systems. The most timid animal in the forest is known as the great hunter. All right, so he's a, a very small rabbit, or a great rabbit, but he, he is known as the hunter. And uh, he places this deer on the ground and very much delights in watching the deer uh, you know, eat the shrubbery and drink of the water and bounce about and so forth, but he's really proud of this creation, this, this great white tail. The four winds though, those four giants from the four corners, they become jealous of this new creation and they hatch a plot. And that plot is to go and hunt the deer. So this is like the first, this is the first hunt of a, of a kind. They go after them with sharpened spears and they attack that white tail and they kill the white tail. And they bring uh, the you know, body back to a, an area where they might um, dress the skin out and lay it to the side and begin to feast uh, on, on this deer. And the rabbit returns through his eye, you know, a, a sort of eye like the sun crossing over top of the sky and sees what has happened and is very displeased and quite upset about this um, destruction and death. But through, uh, through this sacrifice, uh, there's going to come new life. So one of the things that he does is he banishes the four winds to the four corners so that they will not be able to interfere with more of his creations. And he takes that skin of the deer. And if any of you are, are hunters, there's a few gentlemen in here, but if you, if you have a deer skin, they have hollow hairs. And every time you even touch the deer skin, hairs will come off of it. And so he takes this deer skin and he, he flaps it back and forth. And these hairs all come off of the skin, like magical white hairs. And as each one of them lands on the ground, a new deer pops up. So I have some, have some, little, have some little doe uh, fawns there that are, that are beginning to be born. And so the white tails will begin to populate this earth based on the killing of this great deer. And that new deer will come from each one of those hairs. So now, not just one deer, but there's white tail everywhere across the region. So it is from sacrifice that new life will come. 
And in that way, you can also think about a Christian idea that may come along later and uh, in, introduced into this belief system. Once the white tail are there, the plants are made, the waters are created, um, the great rabbit will open up a bag that he has. He's formed and he's made humans and has placed them in that bag and he's been keeping them for a while. But he opens up that bag and he places a man and woman uh, on each one of the lands and so that now humans will populate the earth and that they can, uh, they can take from the animals and they can take from the plants to sustain their life, but they, they continually have to remember this sacrifice and, and, to, and to give offerings. And I'll come back to the offerings uh, in just a moment. So just thinking about positioning some of these figures and images that are up there, a great bag, four giants, the, uh, the fawn, the animal that's known as the great hare, the animal there that's known as the great deer, the tree of life that goes through the middle, the sky dome on the top and the, and the, the, uh, the underworld dome there on the bottom. Next, next slide. So this is a, a, this is a, cosmic, a cosmic time, right? It's how long ago did this happen? A long time ago. Coming forward in time to more recent history that's known through oral traditions and oral history, I'll name now some, some populations, such as you've probably heard of uh, the the Powhatan or the Powhatan people. Some people say Powhatan. It's probably closer to Powhatan. But it's a chiefdom that was uh, centered in the upper regions of the York, uh, in the Mattapanine, Pamunkey drainages. And at one point in time, they were number two. It has also included the upper portions of the James River. And we think of this as like a crescent, almost, of the, of the Powhatan chiefdom. And it, and it, 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 was, it existed as, as early as the 1560s and 1570s. But by the time the Jamestown colonists were settled, the Powhatan chiefdom had expanded down the peninsulas, both the south side, the middle peninsula, um, and, and the peninsula. So that this is the domain of, of that Algonquian-speaking polity at the time of the Jamestown colony. So these are the, these are the native peoples that the first Englishmen uh, will, be, will be engaging. Next slide, please. All right, so th these, are, these are simple chiefdoms. I won't go too long into these pictures because they're kind of hard to see. But our first images of all of Native America come from uh, English-speaking uh, painter John White uh, when he was with the Roanoke Colony just farther south in Carolina in the 1580s. He painted images of men and women and children and families and towns and really brought those images back to England. And it's Europe's first look at Native America is through the lens of John White, of course, he's Anglican, uh, and his perspective on the world. So on screen is a, is a famous village painting and uh, uh, what they call a, a widow wants. I'll talk about that in a moment, and his wife and, and child. So these are simple chiefdoms. They're not hunter-gatherer bands. They're not tribes. They're chiefdoms. And anthropologically, we, we have characteristics that we give to these different kinds of human organization. We would give characteristics to a state as well. Now we're in a global economy. So this is a sort of scale of, of human society. This is the middle ground. This is a chiefdom. So we have a bit of hierarchy, those that are at the top that are in control and the elites, and then a larger population of, of commoners that are below. And there are other social categories. Next slide, please. Now you can't read all of this. I'll go through it quickly. Um, just to give some, some background that these groups are organized with horticultural villages. So they're growing crops, sunflowers, corn, beans, squash. Um, that they are divided between these two tiers of society. We might call them classes if we were in a state level society, like the upper class and the lower class. But in chiefdoms, we might think of them as elites and commoners, two different categories of peoples. Uh, the leaders are hereditarily leaders. They're not elected, all right? That's a different form of government. These are individuals that have inherited their positions of status. Um, there is also other leadership positions. We call the ones for the males uh, widowances, which translates in Algonquin as to being antler wearers. So that great deer does have a, have a role in how they decide who... Uh, what the, what, the, what the emblem of status might be. Women can also be leaders, and we call them widow one squaw. And that's kind of an interesting thing to translate because it means the female antler wearer. And if you know white-tailed deer, the females don't have any antlers. So here's a case where we have a, a female leader, but she's gendered masculine. Interesting to consider that we do have differences in, in gender and, and sex. There's also a group of great men that we call Kakawasas or Kakawizos. And then later that'll become anglicized into what's called a Kakarouse um, in, in Virginia uh, English. 
But uh, this, this character is a counselor. And interestingly, the first part of this word, caw, caw, has to do with a crow or a, a blackbird. Um, and that very wise counsel and chatting uh, that, that a blackbird gives, this is one of the emblems of the cacawizo, is a raven or a blackbird or a crow. Um, and so the beginning of that, that word there in Algonquin talks about sort of um, how intelligent the crow is and how, how wise the, the counselor might be and how chatty a crow can be and how persuasive in speech that a counselor may be. So the first part of it is about persuasive speech. The second part of the word is about wise, wisdom. And then there's a priestly order. This chiefdom society has priests. They have an organized religion. It's not organized quite in the same way that a state-level society would be, but there is a category of individuals who they're mostly, I wouldn't say full-time, but nearly full-time status is to be responsible for the seasonal ritual calendar. The seasons progress through the year, and just like we have in Christianity, uh, different times of the year that we recognize different portions of ceremony associated with the seasons, these individuals do too. They're also responsible for mortuary activities, that is, the, the burials of uh, both elites and commoners. Lastly, I will say there is a group sometimes conflated with the priests called shamans. We'll call them shamans. That's a word from, um, from what is now Russia. But nonetheless, these shamans are individuals who are not concerned as much with the changing of the seasons and the heavenly bodies and the cycles, the annual cycles, but more so you as an individual. Shamans are here for this world. They will help you with luck. They may help you with love. They can make you maybe a better warrior or uh, possibly a better midwife. They have uh, the abilities to work with the spirits in this world to affect a better condition for the human. All right, so while the, the priests take care of the universe, the shamans take care of the peoples. Next slide, please. please. I think I'll skip through some of this. Just, or you could back up just one. I'll say one thing, one thing to uh, just to mark, because it, it's something that's different than our society, um, is that commoners tend to be monogamous with one male and one female being married together, but the elites uh, practice um, they're, they're polygynous, whereby one male might have two or three wives. The elites marry elites and the commoners marry commoners. This keeps the elites in the elite category and the commoners in the commoners category, and it's not unlike uh, other societies in Europe, if you can think about when the royals tend to marry royals and so forth. Um, so this, this exists uh, a difference in marriage between that of the, the elites and, that, and the commoners, and there's also a rank depending on age, so that the senior siblings have more prominence than those that are younger, and they inherit positions first, not unlike primogenitor, that we see in England, um, but also first wives have control over the other wives, and so that there's a rank within, so there's multiple cases of rank. And this kinship, this marriage uh, practice, very important for these peoples, so much so that we see that the elites will have competition over wives. And we have something in this society called bride capture, whereby there can be a stylistic or a, um, it's not really warfare, but it's, it's kind of a, a poetic of warfare whereby an elite bride might be captured and taken by another, another chief. And depending on the competition between the chiefs, the wife might switch from one marriage to another. And uh, this, this has importance anthropologically, but we won't spend much time here. I just wanted to mention that um, these marriages and kinships are very important. Next slide, please. Taking you through briefly the, um, the life cycle of, of males and females, the next few slides will have a number of images that take us from childhood to the transition to elder. And each one of these periods in one's life, like a season, we might think of this, the childhood as being early in the spring, and when they're children, they're not really gendered masculine or feminine, but rather child is, is, the, is the neutral. Um, but it won't be until they start to exhibit characteristics of becoming a male or a female that we really see them take on the roles of males and females. They have a first name that they're given, and that's to identify them as a child. Uh, and if you know anything about Pocahontas, for instance, you may know that she has several names over the course of her, of her lifetime. And that's a practice of these Algonquian speakers is taking a new name marks a change in life. So uh, next slide. When you move into becoming a a, a full-blown male or female, there are physical signals for a woman, 
Um, there are physical, some physical signals for a male, but that's the time in which they will, they will they'll move up in society to, be, to start to become young adults, and they'll take a new name. Uh, there's the Women's Lodge, that this is a series of special ceremonies and spaces specifically for a girl becoming a woman. Uh, for the males, they try to reproduce that, 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 uh, that natural order of becoming childbearers through a ritual called a huskanah, uh, whereby the boys will, the boys will actually, the children will die and they will be reborn as men. And part of that ceremony is, is a, a ritual enacting of that, of that death and rebirth, very much related to creation story in the beginning. Uh, images on screen, one's from Robert Beverly about 1705, where he drew this pen uh, called a Huskanaw pen. There are some uh, psychotropic plants that are taken for these boys that take them into otherworldly dimensions and they are said to lose their memory as children but when they come off of those psychotropic uh, plants they keep them in the pen to stop them from hurting themselves or anybody else but they will be uh, reborn as men and there's uh, quite a bit of quite a bit of ceremony this is a long ceremony it takes multiple days um, next slide please and when they when they emerge as men uh, they will have new haircuts that, that distinguish them physically as being males they'll shave one side of their head completely down to the scalp they'll have a small cox comb at the top and then grow one side of it long and they say this was the this was the path that was shown to them um, by one of those hero twins as the proper way to wear their hair to get a new name they have a new haircut. Women will also uh, take on new, new characteristics. They begin to wear paint. This red paint is very important. It's like a daily red. Today we get up and put our faces on when we go out to see the world, and these ladies will do the same. They also take on new haircuts that demonstrate that they are a marriageable age, and they will take on a new name. Once they become married, they also then get a different type of haircut. So the haircuts really show visually who's who in, in society. Um, once they start bearing children, they'll probably also, if they're in the elite category at least, we know this, uh, begin getting tattoos. And those tattoos will mark a woman as she, as she ages through, through life. Um, foodways, home ownership, uh, working alongside when they're young, girls with the women to learn about plants and about growing of crops and gathering things and making of things, boys alongside their uncles in the ways of hunting and warfare, but they will take on more fully these responsibilities as adult males and female in society. And they will live their lives until that transitions into elder, and this typically is when a male no longer is, is engaged in warfare and a woman's no longer engaged in child, childbirth. And so these, these two categories, they will then take on yet a new name. They will change their haircuts. Uh, and women probably will then, the elites in particular, will begin to get more tattoos. And so facial tattoos really emerge for more senior women. If you can hit the next slide, please. And uh, more senior, the more senior a woman and the more elite a woman probably can be reflected in her very specific uh, tattoo patterns. We see that through John White's drawings, but also if she's an elite status, the wearing of very particular types of pearls, shell beads, feathered garments, certain kinds of paint color, access to non-seasonal foods, etc. So I give you all of this background and information to sort of think about. This is, this is a, it's a full society that has all sorts of roles, all sorts of um, you know, categories of peoples between chiefs and priests and shamans and males and females. It, it's a fully developed human society that's, um, that the English and the Spanish and others will encounter. Next slide, please. Maybe we don't have as much time for this, but this is, about, this, this is a slide about burials. Even in death, the commoners are buried differently than the elites. So the elites have mortuary houses and the priests will dress the bodies not unlike ancient Egypt and they will keep the mummified bodies of the elites lined up um, in secession inside the mortuary houses. The mortuary houses are, are called quiocasins. So if you're ever in Richmond, over near, over, over near that mall, um, there's a Cuyacasin Road there in Richmond. That's the name of a, a, of a, of a charnel house where, where the remains of, of the leadership are kept. And so every village, every town would have one of these out in the woods. The commoners, they're buried individually. And then after a few years, they will, um, they will 
uh, take those remains out of the ground and they will reinter them into a very large communal burial called an ossuary. When you see those, of course, you can visit ossuaries in the Czech Republic and Hungary and France and so forth. They're um, not just Algonquian speakers that have ossuaries. The rituals associated with the funerary rites are very much related to the, the theatrics of boys becoming men. So we have a bit of data about their funerals, but I won't, won't, uh, won't delay here. Next slide, please. Some types of offerings that are made by the religious participants of this society, just uh, as in Christianity and other religions, there are sacraments, and the sacraments associated with the Algonquian speakers. We have uh, shell beads that are white and bright. Uh, we have copper that has a hue that might be red and um, maybe a mediator between two, two areas. We also have um, that red color can be found in uh, suet, uh, blood and suet. And suet's the, the, the white fat from a deer and, and blood that's dried is, can turn very dark and that's also a sacrament. As well as tobacco, indigenous tobacco. This will be later become very important to the colony of Virginia. Uh, this tobacco, but it's used by native peoples as a sacrament. So each one of these categories of shell, of copper, of suet, of blood, and tobacco can be offered to the water, can be offered to the fire, can also be offered out into the air. And these are different realms of, of native beliefs about positive terrestrial um, below is, you know, being chaos. Depending on what actions are needed, what these are, what offerings might be, might be offered. And the English, as on screen, are not entirely in possession of what the distinctions are between priests and shamans, but they try to describe the shaman in English. They call the shaman the flyer because he's thought to maybe that he leaves his body and that his spirit flies about to do, to do, to do the work connecting things on, on this terrestrial world. Translating this into, into European languages across Europe, John White's paintings from the 1580s were published in 1590 in Latin and German and Italian and French and so forth. Um, so the other words for the flyer, are, you'll recognize them too. The conjurer, the juggler, the enchanter, or the wizard. Probably would think the juggler is like a magician. So they're trying to equate what, what, what this category of individual might be and they, they have a, quite a bit of interest. They also associate this figure, the English do, with being a, the devil because of the work that's, that's outside and to be very savage and uncivil. Next slide, please. All right, so we'll conclude our talk about at least the indigenous world with a few slides concerning the priestly order that takes care of. There's five seasons in Virginia, not four, but five. And we actually have here in Virginia, we actually recognize this fifth Algonquian season. We call it Indian summer. All right, so we have fall, winter, uh, spring, summer, and then Indian summer. That's the fifth Algonquian season. The English adopted that when they came here talked about it. got to be cool and then it got hot again. It's that time period between when the corn is ripe and when we f first have the fall of the leaf. So there's five major seasons. Each one of the seasons has annual ceremonies that take place that are important for the priests to organize. An example would be when the corn is, is ripe. They call it the green corn ceremony. That's one example. Another one could come around in the, in the I'm going to say, the dead of winter. Uh, when some of the earliest spring, uh, not quite spring, but earliest fish runs start to happen in the rivers that include the return of shad and the return of sturgeon. These are really important times because it's been a very long winter without a lot of the plants that are available for eating. The crops are, stores are, are kind of becoming thin. And this time in really early spring, late winter is one of the hungriest times for people here. So it's a, on either side, feast and famine, both important ceremonial parts both of, of, of plenty and of suffering. But if you follow along, it's, it's through these processes of um, sacrifice and suffering that will lead to life and, and rejuvenation. Um, so these aspects of calendrical ceremonies that focus on the return of fish, the return of plants, um, they have a calendar that they keep by the moon. And so the moon is our, is our guiding calendar of, of, of 13 different months. Um, and our Gregorian and uh, and uh, calendars of the present don't necessarily uh, work very well with a lunar calendar, but we have 12 months today. And, and, and uh, just as an, uh, as an idea to think about anciently, you know, England and, and Rome and other places followed a, a lunar calendar too. Uh, in evidence of this, the 10th month of the year is October, which of course is the eighth month, Ot, right? So thinking about um, 
how we've, how we've had these Julian and Gregorian calendars to try to sort out the celestial bodies. Uh, these groups are working off the celestial bodies and they have names, we might call them months, for different moons. And every so often they will uh, adjust the 13th moon to, to write the, the calendar. Um, but it's a very much a paying, paying attention to the astronomical, you know, to, to the world and its organization, heaven, uh, terrestrial, and, and below. Uh, yeah. So the Church of England in America, some, uh, maybe before the Church of England arrives, you, you probably know that the Spanish were here in the, in the 16th century, um, spent some time. So the, this region, the Chesapeake, appears on maps in, in Rome and other places um, in Madrid. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is called the Bahia de Santa Maria or uh, the Bahia de Dios de Madre, so the Bay of the Mother of God or the Bay of, uh, of St. Mary by the Spanish. And they capture a young, uh, chiefly person from this region named Paquín Quineo, and he uh, stayed for 10 years abroad with the Spanish, converted to Catholicism, and brought back some Jesuits to this landscape, right through here somewhere, probably on the other side of the York, and founded a mission with the Jesuits. Um, the story didn't go well for the Jesuits after that, though. They were, uh, they were um, killed by the local population, and Pat King Kineo reverted back to his, he was, a, he was an elite person, so he took several wives and moved down to his town with his uncle and took up his, his, um, his role back with his people. But that's in advance of the Church of England coming. So there's a, there's a Catholic period here, but the Catholics will return. Of course, they'll, they'll found St. Mary's 50, 50 years later. They'll, they'll establish the colony of Maryland. England in America starts off in the, in the late, 17th, or excuse me, late 16th century uh, as, a, as a private venture, not really the crown sending out agents here. Peoples like Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, Richard Grenville, these individuals were given charters uh, to be able to establish colonies for profit. Um, in places that we call Virginia today, named for the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. Uh, but the first ones were, 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 were attempted in what is now North Carolina, along the areas of, of in Dare County, the Outer Banks, and so forth. That colony wasn't successful. It's called the Lost Colony today. You may have heard about that in, in history. A hundred and some odd uh, Europeans running around North America. Uh, we have no idea what became of them exactly, but they tried to establish a colony here, tried to set up a, a, you know, a, a church and other things, you know, brought families, and they, they disappeared. When the, when the supplies came back, they were gone, um, and it was a couple of years where they, where they were left to their own devices. But during one of the early attempts to back and forth between England and the Carolinas, uh, one young individual whose name known to history is uh, Manio went to England and spent time there in, amongst the elite circles of merchants and so forth and provided quite a bit of information about um, his, his worldview, his cosmology, and spent time talking with some of the intellectuals of the day. He may be one of the, he's one of the first Algonquians of this region that was baptized and, and brought back to, uh, to this world. And he tried to facilitate the bringing of Christianity and English people uh, to what, what they knew as the new world. Uh, was not successful, but he's an important individual in the story because it's, it's through uh, the early attempts at Christianization we really see a setup of two different types of Christianity. One that has, through the Catholic Church, religious orders like Jesuits, uh, and, and different um, you know, kinds of orders that are directed specifically at conversion and spreading Christianity, whereas the Church of England um, by this time is fairly new, but it did not have the same kinds of orders for, for spreading Christianity. So it's really the opportunity to spread the gospel is through merchants and through learned men and eventually philanthropists who have some standing in England but are not royals, they're really, it's the middle tier of society, but they take up the responsibility or at least the initial efforts of bringing the Church of England into Virginia. And one of those efforts, uh, you probably know the most famous convert of the early period is, is Pocahontas, uh, who was, who was uh, captured, eventually became baptized, took on the name Rebecca, and married to an early planter of the Jamestown colony named John Rolfe. And they took her back to England and paraded uh, her as a real, a real celebrity to try to promote the colonization effort or to bring more funds into the Virginia Company because it was a private effort. And it was only with the arrival of Pocahontas in London that the Crown even paid any attention to what was going on with those early Jamestown colonists. And King James, because of the popularity of Pocahontas in London, 
um, said that he would take up a collection through every parish in England for hopes of converting the natives into the true religion. So the first time that James really recognizes the town they named after him, the river they named after him, etc., was when, Christ, when, when Christian convert Pocahontas was in town and, and quite the popular person. So that collection was taken up to found a school and possibly a mission of some kind in what was then the, the early young colony of Virginia. Next slide, please. Pocahontas conversion. Also, uh, this was early on in the thinking. We don't have categories that we know today as race, for instance. This was formative in the 17th century. Of course, we recognize differences of humans, but the differences were more along the lines of those are the Irish, and we are the English, and those are the Scottish, and those are the Turks. And these, you know, they have different categorical names, but it's not about color. It's more about nationality, and in some cases about civility versus barbarism, you know, thinking that some groups are very barbarous. Other groups are very, very savage, and other groups are civil. So those categories are ones that are being used. The English found the Irish to be quite savage, and they thought the Virginians were quite savage too. So part of what the, the, the transformation of Pocahontas from being savage into civil was to say that the spirit could be, could be salvaged, the human spirit could be, you know, this, this person can be transformed into the, the lens to which the, the uh, Anglican church believed that was possible. It wasn't to last, but for a brief period of time, in the first decades, last decades of the 16th century, first decades of the 17th century, there was a belief that the Irish could be converted into the Church of England, and uh, they could be uplifted, and that the Virginians could also be converted, and they could be up, uplifted into um, enlightenment and into civility. Next slide, please. Uh, and so that effort, as, a, as an example of how that parallel structure is unfolding in English colonialism, they're colonizing Ireland at the same time as colonizing Virginia. Sir Walter Raleigh has, has his hands in both locations. Uh, you know, he, he, has, he has his hands in portions of Ireland and in portions of what's known as the New World. The English established Trinity College in 1595 for hopes of getting ministers into Ireland and to raising and to, to bringing Irishmen into that ecclesiastical and educational network of, of Christianity. And the first attempt here is for the East India School. So some of those monies collected by James were then sent um, to the formation of this, this new educational effort, the East India School, for hopes that they might convert the Virginians and, and to, to become Christians. And this really is, uh, you know, I'll say makes a final blow to the first decades of, of colonization attempts. But the native peoples have lost land uh, because of English encroachment. They have also, uh, the English have upset the balances of elite versus commoner by flooding the region with non non-local materials, including copper, but also all kinds of colored garments and glass beads that are very important to the local natives, these color associations. And so commoners suddenly had access to colors they never had access to before, had access to metals like copper they never had. So it upset the balance between the two. They had defeated the males in warfare. So women are responsible for the land and the horticulture. Men are responsible for hunting and warfare. So the English have really been upsetting cultural aspects of the local population. Now taking children out of the homes and putting them into a schooling environment to convert them, their cosmology, that to Christianity. It was the last, it was the, really the last straw for some of the Algonquians here. And the outcome then would be um, what we call the great assault of 1622, whereby in one day, the qu quarter of the English population was killed. Um, up and down the James River and on portions, portions of, the, of the peninsula, and really to, to try to drive the English back to Jamestown as opposed to all these sprawling plantations. I could talk for a while about all the symbolism that goes around 1622, but it was, it was, an, it was an offensive act to try to restore balance uh, and to get life from sacrifice, I might mention. So the killing of all these people was hopefully going to rejuvenate and give birth, rebirth to the Algonquian cosmology and peoples that had been under attack. Before leaving this slide, I want to point out this, this, this Bible that's translated here into Gaelic, because soon, um, as the decades progress of colonization in the Americas, uh, the English will translate the Bible into Algonquian. So the Bible's first translated to the Algonquian, one of the Algonquian languages here on the East Coast. They're also translating the Bible into Gaelic for the Scots and for the Irish at the same point in time. And um, the communion silver there is at St. John's, 
And uh, that's, of course, the, the, some of the lasting materials from the East India School, um, because the East Indian School was attacked at the same time as 1622, and George Thorpe, who was the, um, was the, I'm not sure if he was a rector, but he was, he was, he was definitely a, a man, a man of, of, the, of, of education and of the cloth and responsible for some of the early conversion efforts. Not a Franciscan, not a Jesuit, but a learned man who had some wealth and means. And so these were independent opportunities. The Bible was translated by uh, funds from the English scientist Robert Boyle, who was also a philanthropist and was important for the propagation of the gospel in foreign parts. So by 1650, 30 years later, um, additional Englishmen are participating in these societies. They're not orders of the church, but philanthropic organizations to spread the gospel in, in foreign parts. Next slide, please. We started a little late, but I think we have a, we have a few minutes. Okay. Um, we don't have much about what happened to the East India School. I can point to its general location in what is now Charles City. Uh, the, you can't see this very well, but it's a commemorative plaque about the first um, Henrico College. It was the first attempt to build a, an institution of higher education for purposes of training up ministers, as well as for teaching the children of the colony, both of England and of the native Virginians, in uh, reading and writing, but also arithmetic and catechisms and all the, you know, the, the Book of Common Prayer, etc. So it was the first format of an attempt, and it's based on what they were doing at Trinity. And we'll see it repeated in just a moment. But uh, the image there is of the destruction of the, of the Virginia English uh, settlements during 1622, which really sparked a 10-year war. 1622 to 32 was 10 years of war between the colonists and the native peoples that resulted in a treaty in 1632. Next slide, please. It's during this time, this middle period, though, at the, end, at the conclusion of, of that, that war, the treaties are signed, we recognize that there have been captives from England living amongst the native population. And one of those captives uh, is an important individual in the history of Virginia Indians with the last name of Bass, several brothers with the last name of Bass. Um, and the Bass brothers have been living amongst the Nansman peoples, uh, but they are of England, English you know, ancestry and origin. And at some point, uh, there appears to be some, some return to the, f the family of Bass that had property uh, uh, that they established on the south side of the James as well as over here um, in, the, in the peninsula. Uh, there appears to be, I want to use the word communion because uh, there appears to be some communion of coming back together with the English family that was not, that was not captured because this Bible um, records that, uh, that um, the, the Bass brothers, John Bass, married the daughter of one of the important Nansman chiefs and that she was, uh, that she was baptized. Um, and that that began an important family. It's not unlike Rolf and Pocahontas because Thomas Rolf, the son, also returns during the 1630s. So for a period of time, there are these native and non-native marriages that are producing Christians. And so there, there develops a tier of society for a very brief time of um, what we might think of in places like Latin America as mestizos or in, uh, in, in Canada as Métis, that is the word mixed. We don't really have that word so much in English today that we use, but of native origin and English origin who are wearing the, the trappings of English society and clothes and attending church and fraternizing with the elites of the native population and fraternizing with the elites of the emerging colonial population. Very brief period of time, but it's not to be. Next slide, please. In 44, there's another great uprising against the colonists, a, uh, a great assault, we should say, against the colonists from the native population. We believe that some of that was driven by sectarian violence ongoing in England of the time. If, if you're familiar with your English history, this was a time of great turmoil in the late 1630s and 1640s that eventually led to Charles being uh, deposed and you know, being executed and the rise of Cromwell in the, in the, in the period uh, of, of the mid-century. Mid and so England is in great turmoil, multiple religious factions. Um, England kind of leaves Virginia on its own during the mid-century. And Virginia, I say strangely, becomes the very most royal and loyal and, and Anglican of all the colonies because there's Catholics in, in, in Maryland, there's Puritans in New England, Quakers have emerged, there's you know, Calvinist leanings. And so Virginia really has a, uh, an interesting positionality in this, in this, in this in 
English Christianity variety of being the most Anglican, the most royal uh, in terms of allegiance to the crown. They even invite the king of England to come over and stay in exile in Virginia while they figured out what to do about Cromwell and the, and, and the others. Berkeley is the, is, the, uh, is the governor at that time. It's not, it didn't, didn't work out that way, but, but eventually um, James II will come to power and um, there's some leanings back and forth whether or not he's a Catholic sympathizer. But at the time of the Glorious Revolution, two firm uh, uh, supporters of the Church of England, which will be Queen King William and Queen Mary, come to the throne. And uh, we see an important development here in Virginia. It's, it's been a long time since a college was proposed. It was proposed during Berkeley's, Berkeley's administration. They had started one. It was discontinued in the earlier part of the 16, uh, you know, teens and 20s with Henrico College. But now they propose to create the College of William and Mary. And they go back, uh, James, um, uh, he's, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, there's a proposal to create a college in Virginia that will help uh, train ministers of the gospel so that no longer does the colony have to rely on churchmen being trained up in England and being sent to Virginia, but rather Virginia can, can educate and grow its own clergy. Uh, this is one of the impetus of, of creating the, the College of William and Mary. But in order to do so, they have to go back to, the, back to England and to seek funding and to seek a charter and to seek... Um, so what we see on screen is the charter for the College of William and Mary. So um, there are only four, four royal colleges at this time when this is founded. One is, one is Trinity, and we've already mentioned. There is uh, Cambridge, uh, there is Oxford, and then there's William and Mary. So this, these are the four institutions, and they start it, and they build it, and they hope it will take, take root. While there, uh, Reverend James Blair, who's, a, who's one of the main agents of, of this effort, identifies that Robert Boyle, the famous English scientist, who's now very elderly in the late 1680s and early 90s, has, uh, has wealth, and he's been interested in the propagation of the gospel in foreign parts. He's funded the translation of the Bible into multiple languages, including Algonquian. He's been instrumental in Harvard, the founding of Harvard and establishing Harvard. And so there is a, a plot hatch to see if Boyle can support William and Mary. But to do so, uh, the request is that they also educate the natives. So the first few lines of the Charter of William and Mary founds the college, but also the Indian school for the same purposes of, re of, of educating the youth of Virginia, both of English as well as native orientation, and to teach them, and they hope, will make ministers in both populations. Next slide, please. These are some of the, some of the individuals. Uh, James Blair there on the, on the left-hand side. He was uh, appointed the commissary of the Bishop of London during his, during his time in Virginia at the time of the Glorious Revolution. A portrait of Robert Boyle that uh, was given to the college by his nephew in the 1730s. And then an image of, an image of the seal of the College of William and Mary, this, this uh, you know, the sun of enlightenment above that, above that institution. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about, this, about the story of the founding of the college and its relationship to the Indian school, I definitely could answer, answer other questions um, about that. Next slide, though, please. The Indian school wasn't really successful in the first few years of making any ministers. They were able to get a few students from the local tribes by making arrangements, political arrangements, between Alexander Spotswood, who was lieutenant governor, and the local Pamunkey chief, uh, queen, and chief men also the Nansman, the Nottaway, and so individuals from the elite families sent one or two members of their family to go to the school. And as long as they kept a student at the college, at the Indian school, the treaties that they had established over the course of the 17th century were said to be in good, in good standing. So it, it demonstrated their alliance with the crown, but also further supported this elite band of society that had a little bit of connection to Europe, uh, to England, and a little bit of connection to, to the, the native world. Um, it wasn't going to stay that way, but for a brief time in the 17th century, there was this, this interface and interaction between these two elite categories of society. Alexander Spotswood, though, was really interested in seeing widespread conversion, not just a few students from the elite families. He founded Fort Christana on the frontier during the early 17 teens. And at that location, they built, uh, they, they had a fort, so they had a military garrison, 
They had a school that they constructed. They put a church there and, and a minister. And unlike maybe an Indian school in Williamsburg that had maybe 10 students, there were about 180 to 100 Indian students at this particular school. And I should also mention that they accepted boys and girls at the Fort Christ Dana School, not just boys, which was the case at, at William and Mary. Next slide, please. So William and Mary, uh, their Indian school continued to, do, to receive funds from Robert Boyle's estate. Um, that's a complicated narrative, but also had funds associated with the fur trade, taxation on tobacco. They had college lands that were taken from Indian treaty lands. Lots of lines of funding going into establishing the college. At one point in the 1730s, they built a building for the actual Indian school, and they named it for the Yorkshire Manor in uh, that Boyle's estate owned called the Brafferton. So the Brafferton Indian School is named for the Boyle estate uh, purchase in, in Yorkshire. And it's probably the most uh, steady native school for a uh, school for, for native youth over the course of the 18th century. It's open the entire century and until the American Revolution when the funds were taken away by, of course, the American Revolution cut, cut off lots of ties with England and the funding for the school as well. But it stopped, it stopped trying to make um, ministers early on and realized that its, it's true calling was to, was to create liaisons, diplomats, translators. And so really what it produced from about, say, the 1730s until the time of the revolution were those chief men's sons and nephews, Indian traders who had married a native woman and their kids would go there and they would have loyalties then both to the Scottish and to, and to the native community. Native communities saw there was some utility in having someone who could read and write, particularly in dealing with deeds, treaties, translating diplomatic meetings. So translators had a lot of power because they stand right behind the chief and the colonial official. So that's what aspects of the Bradford and Indian School really produced. And it's quite different from what was happening in New England, where they remained the focus on Christianity and developing preachers. So while these individuals emerged from the college literate, they, did, they, they were, uh, in some cases, converted to Christianity, but they were not destined to become preachers to, trans, uh, to, to um, go back home and, and to create converts am amongst their people. Next slide, please. Outcomes of the American Revolution include disestablishment in, in Virginia, so the, the Church of England will eventually become uh, transformed. There's a lot of suspicion with the, with the church at the time of the American Revolution because it was related to the elite, related to crown, and they wanted to get rid of just about all of the trappings associated with the crown. They moved the colony's capital from Williamsburg to Richmond. Um, they disestablished the, 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 the Church of England here, and they transformed that into the Episcopal Church. And then eventually, though, um, because of the, 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 the long-term Christian outreach to Native communities in this region, partially through the William and Mary, but partially just for living for several hundred years in Christian parishes next door to um, Europeans of different descent. Uh, Native peoples here knew that Christianity had a lot of um, potential, that there was power associated with the church, um, and as laws increasingly became restrictive for, for non-white peoples, once race became a, very much a defining factor in the 18th and 19th century, there was a recognition that that people, native people couldn't meet publicly without getting in trouble because there was real concern about the congregation of say the enslaved people or free people of color. But in the context of the church, they could meet. They could meet and they could organize and they could put their leaders up into public spaces. And so uh, one of my colleagues at, uh, today at William & Mary has the hypothesis that the Baptist movement became really, um, the communities, uh, native communities became very taken by the Baptist movement because it, it argued that you could have a, a personal relationship with God and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ without the mediator uh, that might be of, of the more formal and hierarchy of the established church. And this seemed to be a really important aspect of the native engagement because they could take their people, the calling inside the congregation, to raise up somebody who could be a leader. And so in some ways, the priestly category of the Algonquins became merged with the chiefly category of the Algonquins. And even today, we see that many of the leaders of the native communities here in Virginia are both serious religious people in their churches as well as leadership figures in their, in their communities. So that's one of the outcomes of, the, of, the, of this. And it transformed their allegiance from, say, what was the Anglican church from Episcopalian, kind of orientation towards the Baptist 
movement. And the Pamunkey tribe, not far from here, uh, they founded the first Baptist church in, King, in, the, in their King William County in the 1790s. Um, so today, just about all the Virginia Indians uh, are Baptists. There are some exceptions. Nansmans are Methodist-leaning. And uh, there was an Episcopal mission in the 19th century to the group called the Monicans today. Next slide, please. So some of these outcomes that we have, the oldest native church in Virginia is at Pamunkey. They founded that after the Civil War. Um, they moved their, their congregation from Colossae, well, it was called Lower College Baptist Church at that point, and then it was Colossae Baptist Church. And then after the Civil War and uh, the abolishment of slavery and the freeing of all, uh, all of the slaves, um, that church that once had all three peoples, African, Indian, and European together in one congregation started to break out into these segregated congregations. So, so Pamunkey founded its own church on its reservation in, in, the, 60, uh, excuse me, in the 1860s. Um, and so today, uh, I would say that each one of the native communities in the region has an affiliation with, with the church. I could point to other outcomes of, uh, of the engagement in Christianity. I'd say it's ironic that some of the Brafferton students, when they became adults after the Baptist movement came to be, some of them actually did become preachers uh, and did begin to work inside their community. So while the goals of the college and the goals of the church weren't accomplished during the time in which it was open, later in time, those goals, those objectives came to fruition uh, so that we, we have a, a, a converted population in this region today. And I think Pocahontas still has, has a very much a, um, this is the last slide, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. And it, Pocahontas still has a very much a, a role in, uh, in the religious lives of Virginians today. Um, and she does hold a very special place within the native history of the region um, as being, you know, in some ways, America has taken on Pocahontas, has taken, made Pocahontas American. Um, so it's really been, she's, she's been taken from the native community specifically and, and now is seen, uh, you know, to, to, to be uh, in some ways the mother of America because it's a joining of, of Europe with, with America and, and she has a role of, of, you know, bringing two peoples together. And, and today, if you were to visit Washington, D.C. and to go to the National Museum of the American Indian, there's an exhibit right now called Americans. And it shows all the ways that native peoples have been made icons and everything from Pontiac. Um, as a car, uh, to uh, Cherokee as a Jeep, you know, as a Jeep or a pair of jeans, uh, to Pocahontas apples. And there's an entire exhibit up about this sort of borrowing of native materiality and iconography to expand it into Americana. But there's one room dedicated just to Pocahontas and the role that she's played uh, in American culture over the past 400 years. So interested in all of these topics, but I think we've, we've reached right on time. We started about 15 minutes early and I'm, and I'm finishing up right about five o'clock. So let's, uh, let's open up for some questions. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Woodard? Hmm. Troublemaker, huh? Hello. Hi. How are you? Uh, I had the pleasure of working in Jamestown Settlement, and I was Indian in the Indian Village. I learned so much, not only from just the re readings I had to do mm -hmm. just to work there, but from what visitors would ask. And basically, really not understanding the Palatine culture, that's how the way we pronounce it, Palatine. Well, I, I, so I've listened to some of the, um, some of the English say it, and they say Poetan. Poetan. Anyway, so I thought, oh, right, Poetan. That probably sounds more like what it should be because there is no, Algonquin doesn't have the construction in English that we have with the W and the H that makes that W that's in what. So the Virginia Algonquin has a voiceless W, so it's probably Poetan. Well, we used to use just one word, Wigapo. Yeah, hi. My good man. Hi, how are you? Yeah. I, I just wanted to comment for a moment on what I found fascinating uh, when I had to tear a hide was the use of every part of the deer. Mm -hmm. And what the person demonstrating at that time was saying, now we're going to get to the deer's brain. And visitors go, ooh. But I found it just stayed in my memory 
that they had figured out after killing a deer, doing their ceremony, mm. and getting the hide, and there was a brain left. Rain came, a piece of this hide fell on the brain, and softened. Yes, I had it's to do uh, that myself. You with, learned a lot. I learned a lot. Yes. But it was good to be able to explain to people how the tough skin that might be on top of a drum mm -hmm. could be made into a very comfortable. Almost like flannel. And it, it was great. Brain tan, some of the best leather I to wear. It. Believe yeah. it or not, we didn't have the brain of a deer. We you could had use pigs. Brain, but I won't mention that animal. Okay. But just to tell you, I enjoyed your talk. And, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. And, and uh, I think if anybody could you know, explore the mystery and the wonderful things about the Native Americans, it would help understanding. So, thank well, thank you. you so much for being here. I've got a question. Okay. How, with the cosmology you, you laid out for us with Native American beliefs, mm. they're, they're hearing this message of Christianity. And you had some allusion to the very beginning, but what, what was their take on it all? I mean, did they, did they reject it? Did they accept it? And how did the, what did the English think was going on? Well, we see multiple cases where it appears Native peoples had a lot of flexibility in their beliefs. So if, if someone they encountered um, could show them, uh, you know, say a particular type of medicine that was coming out of the woods could treat something, or they had a certain type of cure that they could ask for a shaman, and that shaman had a lot of power. If it was even foreign ideas, they were willing to bring that in and accept that um, into their sort of belief system. So it would seem that multiple cases, whether we're in the Yucatan or we're on the St. Lawrence River or we're here in Virginia, that the early conversations, there's a lot of you know, pondering and listening. That like, okay, right, you, you, have a, um, you have certain restrictions during certain times of the year. Yeah, we do too. Yeah, so um, you have special people that wear black and you know, they take care of, yes, we have those special people over here as well. Um, you know, you, you believe in sacrifice and, uh, and then resurrection. Yeah, we also have a sacrifice and resurrection. So it seems to be a lot of compare and contrast, and so, and, but willing to also uh, incorporate new patterns and maybe in some ways going through the rote of Christian ceremony and ritual, but underneath of that was in some cases Algonquin, in other cases the Iroquoian, um, continuing of belief systems that were indigenous, but just simply uh, merging the two, and we might think of that as a type of syncretic religion. Some rel religions today in Native communities are true syncretic religions, a borrowing of traditional and Native and making them into something that's, that's new altogether. Um, the longhouse tradition of the Iroquois, for instance, is a, is a syncretic religion um, that does have aspects of Christianity as part of it, as well as earlier period. But there really are also true converts and individuals who, and I think the longer in time that uh, people are practicing Christianity and the more, f and particularly with the collapse of the priestly order and the merging of, of the priestly order with the chiefly order, that those older traditions and beliefs, they become, it's, it's lost, the cult, the aspect, and that's, that, that's just, that's, everybody goes through culture change and that's one of the, that's one of the processes I think that unfolded here. Population loss, but also just adopting a lot of the, over several hundred years, the, the cultural practices and traditions of all the people that, that were around them. And the evidence today is visiting some of the native communities and seeing you know, how, how very much um, they are uh, steeped in the Bible and the religious traditions and, and uh, in the Baptist church at least. Kathy? Would it be fair to say that that was not um, two directional? that while the indigenous populations were taking on some of the um, Christian, Anglican, Episcopal mm -hmm. um, traditions or, or approaches, that the English were not taking on the indigenous population's positions? Not as a, not as a society, but on an individual level, I would say there are multiple examples in this, particularly the 18th century and early 19th century, where those captives that were taken during times of conflict and were taken back to native communities. And like Pocahontas, they took on new names and new haircuts and new clothing and married somebody and you know, were raised up. 
and when given the opportunity to come back to uh, American English or American homes or their families, rejected that opportunity and wanted to stay with their families, their native families and their native communities, practicing not just religion, but all of their cultural traditions. So there was some, and, and I think for enslaved peoples who were part of that narrative too, there's another dimension of freedom that would, that would encourage them not to come back to that oppressive and restrictive society where they had so much freedom and opportunity and equality in some of the native communities. So I think there's different, there are multiple motiv motivating factors. I'm struck by the New England, some of the New England, they call them praying towns in New England, some of the large conversions that took place among the Algonquian speakers there who had the Bible in Algonquian and so that the preacher was Algonquian, the congregation was Algonquian, the text was Algonquian, uh, and that literacy was for a brief time, it you know, didn't, didn't continue, but for a brief time, those Algonquian speakers were writing deeds and letters and you know, uh, ideas about all sorts of things in Algonquian, um, but very much influenced by the, the, the English culture that, 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 that was around them. So was, I think there's, there's points in the historical record where we can see a lot of cross-pollinating going on or you know, different formations of this interaction that aren't the same everywhere. And English conversion maybe to, to native traditions is probably a, a, a it's minor, you know, but it is present. It is present, it, but it doesn't, it, it, it's not society-wide that we know of, at least. Is there one more question, Lynn? Would you say that the experience in the Virginia colony of the English setting up two schools for the Native Americans, mm -hmm. the Indians. Mm -hmm. Was that unique to the Virginia colony or was there something similar in other colonies with other aspects of the Algonquin? Absolutely, so uh, we have to make a distinguish. So these are colonial schools. And, uh, and so there are multiple of the Ivy Leagues that have the similar origin. So Harvard has an Indian school, Princeton has an Indian school, um, William Mary has an Indian school, uh, and I think if I'm drawing, is it not, it's not Cornell, is it Cornell? I'm drawing a blank on which other one, is it Princeton? Gosh. Yale. Yale, thank you. There we are. Yale had an Indian school. So these are... Um, colonial schools, though, and they don't continue in time past the, in most cases, past the colonial period because their agendas, uh, in some cases, are Christian about conversion, but who goes to those schools tend to be prominent people from the tribes. So the Delaware chiefs, they'll send a couple of sons or nephews of the prominent chief men back east to receive an education at a colonial Indian school. It's not bringing the whole tribe, just a few people. Um, the Catawba, they don't want to send all their kids. They just want one or two. So, we, so um, at one point, for instance, the Catawba, who had been coming to Williamsburg from South Carolina, the, um, their, their Bradfordian student was in his senior years, and they said, look, we're going to need another one. So they called, and they wrote and said, can we, uh, can we send someone up? And we're not taking any more Native students at William & Mary because the, the funding stopped here, and the funding stopped at Harvard, too, and the funding stopped from other... As long as they were tied to English sources, they would have to come up with funds here on this side of the, of the water to continue those efforts. Most of the English or British funds were redirected towards their other colonies, so the Caribbean and Canada. Um, so most of the Native funds with the church, too. William & Mary actually went to court to sue um, the, the trustees of the Boyle Estate, to sue the Bishop of London, to sue the church, um, to get the monies from, the, they said, even though we're not politically aligned any longer, all of us are inside the Church of God. So, you know, maybe you can send those monies back over here and we can keep on with our work. And uh, the, the court in England said, no, sorry. We're, not, we're going to redirect it to some, other, to some other pious purposes, and they're going to the Caribbean. So that, 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 can, that came to a conclusion. But this is an area of research that one of my colleagues and I are going to be continuing. We wrote a book about William and Mary and the Brafferton, uh, and we recognize now because of conversations that are in the present uh, about Indian missionary church, uh, excuse me, schools like boarding schools. Hampton became one of these, a boarding school. It's a different phenomenon in the 19th century and 20th century than these colonial schools. Um, boys and girls are going, large numbers are in attendance, it's all about getting rid of culture and replacing it, whereas it seems that colonial schools really were looking to make a few people agents, a little bit of both, 
They didn't want them to lose their language. They wanted to keep the language so they could be translators. So that's different than what's happening at the boarding schools. But I think they, they tend to get, in the media today, collapsed in people's minds because it's, it's convenient. So to think about what was going on at Harvard or what was going on at Yale or Princeton or William and Mary uh, when there were so many chiefs and presidents and governors and military officials in connection with each other and they were all participating in these, some of these same projects together. It, was, it benefited both sides to have a few people who were in these orientations. So. I know our time is almost up. I saw two hands. I think I saw yours first, Terry. So if you could, and I also know that members of the Augustine Warner chapter may want to slip over to the parish house and begin getting ready. So let me give them permission to do so if they need to do that. Thank you. Delightful. I think you kind of answered the question, but the difference between the colonial schools for the Indians and what became the 1800 schools for the Indians, in the colonial school, they didn't try to take away their native culture and change their appearance and change their clothing, or did they? They did change the clothing and the change the appearance. I think um, that had a number of practical reasons why, um, in terms of, for instance, supplying students with clothing. They didn't have the resources, for instance, to continue supplying moccasins. Um, I mean, but when you think about the Hampton School and the horrificness of, you know, you will have not have this culture. Yeah, that was, um, hmm. I, I mean, I think there's points along the way where that was seen to be inappropriate for society in which they were being educated. But you know, they also invited older, older people to come with those young boys so that they could speak with them and keep the language. And they would not ask those older individuals to change their clothing or appearance. Um, but it, it would seem that living for a couple of years in Williamsburg did influence the wearing of shoes. Uh, you know, because, for instance, they became a pamunky shoemaker. You know, he, he learned a trade while in Williamsburg, and so he practiced the trade of, of making shoes. Um, but they also learned uh, music, and dances, and, out, you know, and, and they wore those outfits. But also in the 18th century, and this is not widely known, there is a lot of back and forth textiles are streaming out of England into Indian country. And if you were to see portraits of native leaders of the period, they're wearing complete European attire, as well as cloth that's been transformed into a native orientation, but it's English woolens and linens and cottons. Uh, they've got silver on, glass beads. And think about just the origination of some of those materials from Stroud, England, or from Liverpool, or from uh, Venice. Uh, you know, where are these different people's you know, silk ribbons from Paris? They're being worn by Cherokees way out, you know, away from the colony. So that the wearing of, you know, coming to Williamsburg for some native delegation was, was a chance to get that tricorn hat, was a chance to get the bed lace, the gold bed lace, or a chance to get blue or red broadcloth to find the glass beads from what we today call Czech Republic that was, uh, you know, pro, um, Bohemia at the point in time, to get silver medallions that were replacing shell re medallions rather than having a face of a maybe an orientation that was related to that cosmology I had on screen, instead having an image of the, of the seal of, of the King of England, which also carried power and had a, had a belief. And so there, I think there was a lot, 18 centuries of time, and there's a lot of merger, a lot of merger. We have to find an explanation to go from brick ranchers and Cadillacs of the present to get back to you know, Pocahontas and, and her buckskin apron and, and Yohokan of the past. There is that middle space, and I think that's one space, that colonial period Late, eight, late 17th through the 18th century is one of that transformational time period that, that we should recognize. The conversation, I know we have a couple questions we'd love to ask, but I also know that the time is getting late, and I encourage you, and, and Dr. Wood is going to be at the reception, so I encourage you to go have some nibbles, uh, share your reflections with each other, ask Dr. Woodard some other questions as we're there. Um, but I just want to thank you on behalf of the entire congregation. Thank you for coming and kicking off our, our thinking about 
what is the context where this church began and where the things are going on that aren't unique to this church, but certainly were influencing the wider area. For those of you who are here, um, the, the program that you received as you came in is for all four lectures. And so if you're coming back, bring that back each time. Um, and so you'll have all four. If you're not coming back, take it with you and say, gosh, I came to the first one and my schedule led others. Um, but then do plan on coming back for the other presentations we have in this series. And thank you again for kicking off in such a good way.